Hello and welcome to Pearl Magazine. The fifth wave of COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically brought the number of coronavirus infections up. Hundreds of thousands have been infected and hundreds have died COVID-related deaths since 2020. The government has ordered citywide testing for all Hong Kongers in the hopes of ending this wave, if not the pandemic, soon. Tonight, Pearl Magazine sits down with Dr. Sarah Borwin, who's trained in infectious disease epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hello, Melissa. Thank you for having me. Great. So I wanted to ask you about this testing. You know, it's going to take place over roughly three weeks, maybe a little bit more. Is this going to help Hong Kong or is it a super spreader waiting to happen? Well, start, let's start with the hard questions, why don't we? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Look, I don't want to disparage uh, mass testing. China has done an exceptionally good job with mass testing when they've implemented it. They're probably the world experts on it, and they've used it effectively to shut down epidemics in China, outbreaks of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But it's typically done when there's tens or hundreds of cases at the most, not when there's tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of cases as we have now. And so I do worry that the mass testing at this point could, the resources put into it could probably be better used elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And yes, that it could even be counterproductive. So in, as right. you mentioned, it could be a super spreader event. It, you're bringing people together into testing centers, presumably waiting long periods of time for their testing. You're also going to pick up people who've already had COVID because mm -hmm. the test is so sensitive we'll pick up what we call repositives. So we'll do that. And we're going to make people really anxious about right. it. And that matters because when people are very anxious, they're much less cooperative with our public health measures. Exactly. So it's, it's really important that we allay that. There was modeling done by the University of Hong Kong School of Public Health, and their numbers suggested that at our peak, which will probably be mid to late March, we would be looking at more than 180,000 cases per day. Right. That's a lot. Now, I got to ask, um, would it then make sense to have a citywide lockdown and do, say, those three rounds of testing in a shorter period of time and identify your positives and your negatives? Well, I, then it begs the question of what are you going to do with all those positives? Because if you're talking about isolating them, it's impossible to isolate that many cases in any kind of community isolation facility. So you'll be looking at home isolation. And do we really need to lock down and take people out of their home? If you lock down and then take people to a testing center, would it perhaps be equally as effective to dish out rapid tests and have people test at home. Right. It's true that rapid tests are less accurate, but does that matter in our current situation? Would it be a better use of resources? Right. So. And given the numbers that you mentioned on the modeling, um, do we have the facilities to uh, isolate that many people? No, we don't. So we don't. And so the issue is now we really should focus on only two things. One is saving lives. We're having too many people die. We have to focus on saving lives. And the second is on keeping the healthcare system from collapsing. It is really on the verge. And when the healthcare system collapses, the death rate skyrockets because people can't get care for even basic things, even milder COVID serious enough to need hospitalization, but can't get oxygen, for mm -hmm. example. We saw that happen in India. And also, other health problems don't stop happening. People still have heart attacks and strokes and cancer and pregnancy complications exactly. and all of those things. And we are already in a situation where it's quite difficult to access some of those things in the public system. Right. So some of the resources that are being spent, massive resources on mass testing, could they maybe be better spent, for instance, leveraging the private system mm -hmm. to deliver some of that care? Could they be better spent increasing capacity in the healthcare system and especially on ramping up vaccination even faster and even further because it's really our best tool? Right. You know, you talk about vaccination. Is that kind of our, our star tool in the fight against this virus and should it really be mandated?
Well, it definitely is the most important tool that we have. We know that the vaccinations are incredibly effective at preventing severe disease and death. There's some confusion in the community because I do hear people say to me, oh, but you can still get COVID if you've had the vaccine. And that is absolutely true, Mm -hmm. particularly with this newer variant, Omicron. You can still get it, but your chances of dying are reduced at least tenfold, probably 18-fold, if you're fully vaccinated and boosted. Right. So it is our most important tool. Now, how do we get people to have it? Mandates, when we say mandate, we don't mean hold people down and stick a needle in them against their will. Mm, Right. (laughs) But we can make life difficult for people to not be vaccinated. And that is happening around the world because governments around the world have found that that is what they need to do to get out of this situation. Yeah, exactly, which is what's happening now. And I mean, you know, to make it difficult for people to get around and also to keep up this dynamic COVID zero that uh, that the government wants to have. How how doable is that really for Hong Kong, you know, was it success? It seemed to have been successful last year. What's your take on this zero yeah. COVID strategy? Well, you know, Hong Kong uh, zero COVID was an incredibly successful strategy until it wasn't. So, and that's the long and the short. I think it was the right strategy at the beginning, and I think Hong Kong did it very, very well. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world could take lessons on how we implemented zero COVID early on. But it's a holding strategy. Because unless the virus is going to go away forever, at some point, you have to stop doing zero COVID. Mm -hmm. You need an exit strategy. You need a plan for exiting from zero COVID. And that seems to be where we haven't been as strong. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've seen other countries do it. From a medical standpoint, what is the best course of action uh, when it comes to kind of balancing the public's health with quality of life and ideally exiting this zero yes. <laughs> COVID. Yes, I think we're all a little bit tired of it. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I think we can look at other countries that have done a good job. And um, the two that come to mind immediately are Singapore and Australia, both of which had strict zero COVID strategies, but have also managed to transition out of it or are in the process of transitioning out of it through a combination of very high vaccination rates, um, very good, consistent, and strong public health messaging that's clear and trusting government and flexibility. And by flexibility, I, I don't mean being reactive to everything that happens and panicking. I mean having a plan that you can pivot to when things don't go the way you hoped they would. Right. So Hong Kong hoped that they could maintain zero COVID indefinitely. We could kind of see this Omicron comet streaking across the sky towards us. Mm -hmm. And yet we thought that if we were more and more strict with our quarantines and we culled the hamsters and we, you know, we practiced social distancing, that we could keep Omicron out. And we could see around the world that that wasn't going to happen. Right, exactly. I mean, we've had flight bans going on for for the last year. Yeah. Uh, is it, does it make sense to continue with these flight bans, to continue with these long quarantines of, of arrivals, vaccinated arrivals who test negative? Uh, does it make sense to keep that going? Well, from a scientific point of view, Omicron has a very short incubation period of about three days. It's one of the things that makes it so terrifying, actually. Very short incubation period. You're contagious from one or two days before you show symptoms, if you show symptoms, to three to five days afterwards. So by seven days, it's not impossible, but very unlikely that you will transmit to anyone. So, of course, two to three weeks of quarantine is not scientifically necessary in that in that setting. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is likely that there are other reasons for doing it, such as discouraging people from traveling at all. Right. Now, I got to ask this. We are seeing a lot of children get infected and, you know, and dying. Yes. This is a high death rate for children compared to other countries. Yes. What, what is the what, what is going this? on? Yes, this is this has been really tragic. We have had several deaths in children, and uh, we don't exactly know what's going on there. So we know that 
Omicron has some tendency to be more severe in children. It possibly because it attacks the upper airways more and children have small passages that are maybe more prone to becoming obstructed or, um, but we don't know for sure. Other countries have seen higher hospitalization rates in the Omicron wave. I think in New York, it was up to 400% increased in the pediatric population compared to previous waves, mm -hmm. but they didn't see deaths. Mm -hmm. And that has been repeated elsewhere. So why have we seen deaths? So one of the possibilities, of course, is it's just to do with high numbers and terrible, tragic chance. A small number of kids will do poorly. Uh, I have a concern that one of the things that could be happening is that between the messaging that Omicron is just a cold and the fear that parents have of being separated from their children in hospital, that they delay seeking care for them. Mm -hmm. People need to be confident that they that they will not be torn away from their infant. Exactly. So there's that. Uh, there is a theory as well that our children have been so protected over the last two years from any virus, really nothing. They've worn masks, they've been out of school, they've been socially distanced. We haven't had any viruses really significantly circulating. And so their immune systems are like out of shape. Right? Exactly. <laughs> they haven't had any exercise. Yes. And we have no community immunity to coronavirus because we've been so successful with zero COVID that we have no level of community immunity. Right. And then there's this theory that is the variant. So we have a variant of Omicron that is spreading through Hong Kong is the BA2 variant. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's a subvariant. So, and there is a little bit of preliminary evidence that maybe it's, not only more transmissible than the first Omicron, but also maybe a bit more severe. And maybe it's worse in children. We don't know. It could be that in other places where the first variant went through first, it gave them a kind of protection against mm -hmm. the second variant when it swept through and we right. didn't catch the severity signal. I see. But all of these are just theories. We don't know. Okay. What we do know is that we can protect children by vaccinating them as young as three. We, pregnant women can protect their newborns by getting vaccinated in pregnancy. And you can vaccinate people who care for children who live with them. So your best tool is still vaccination. Sarah, thanks so much for your views and your inputs tonight. When we come back, a business leader's perspective on the government pandemic efforts. Stay with us. Welcome back to Parole Magazine. It's not easy for government leaders to balance people's livelihoods with their health and safety. Has the government done enough to protect local business operators and keep the city's status as an international business hub? Pearl Magazine talks to business leader Michael Tien to see what he thinks. So, Michael, thanks for joining us on the show tonight. Uh, the government is planning this mass testing of 15 days or more. What is your take on this? It's doable. We need to have a tick bite the bullet do a mandatory testing, separate, you know, the infected from the non-infected, all right, at one point. Right. But the key is that we need to do it within a very short period of time, because otherwise, after you get tested, then you still have cross-contamination. That's why I've been proposing a lockdown, a complete citywide lockdown to go together with mandatory testing. Any mandatory testing without a compulsory lockdown is actually... Uh, half-baked and it has very little effect if you ask any experts but Hong Kong being what it is we cannot have a one-month lockdown like Wuhan or other cities in China so my proposal is to really squeeze it down to the absolute minimum and I was proposing nine days two weekends mm -hmm. and five weekdays and everything shut down all the businesses they work from home they zoom all right everything comes to the storm for uh, local consumption uh, economy, uh, seven days. It's better than now because the business is only 20% of what we have before, so it doesn't make any difference. Right. Is nine days too long, though, for some businesses to survive? And Oh, no, no, no. Nowadays, business is doing 20 30% of what it was before. They are dying. If you have zero business in nine days and then they resume, Okay, kickstart the economy again by relaxing the social distancing rule. I tell you, everybody that I know of is supporting this with a standing ovation. I am proposing that they squeeze 
two times of testing into nine days. Right. All right. So they have to do that. Yes. Then the third testing will be done after the lockdown is, uh, you know, uh, okay. relaxed. And uh, so that means that after the lockdown, businesses can resume. They can all open. No more closures and uh, full opening hours. Yes. Yes. When the nine day uh, lockdown finishes, there will be maybe a few more days for them to collect the data, separate everything. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, uh, I'm hoping that they could have uh, everything resumed to a normal set. Normal set that doesn't mean zero social distancing, mm -hmm. but it would mean that we can have dinner out at night again. You can have your bar. We probably still need masking mm -hmm. in open places for a long period because we're still practicing zero COVID. Right, okay, right. but in terms of many other uh, restrictions now, they should be relaxed. And most people in Hong Kong would prefer to take a short term pain to gain something that is more uh, reasonable. Uh, there has to be enough uh, isolation facility to separate those who are infected and those that are not. Mm -hmm. Now, if they don't have enough isolation capacities, all right, they're, they're cranking up all that now. But there may still be a shortfall because we don't know what's the result of the mandatory testing. It could be more than the facility they have. Then the rest are forced to stay home. Okay. Now let's talk about the quarantine for arrivals for um, Hong Kong citizens arriving. It was at 21 days. It's currently at 14. I think 21 days is horrendous. Mm -hmm. They should change that. All right. They should change it to 14 days. And I think 14 days is fair to cover both of these variants. I had spoken to Amcham, and Amcham had said one of the things that their members are really struggling with is the children, the education system, this homeschooling. Hong Kong has been on homeschooling actually since 2019. How long can this go on? After the testing, do you think this is something that could resume regular school in class? I think. The zero COVID policy is tenable in the long run if we have enough isolation facilities, right? And we really seal off the airport to it airtight, all right? Mm -hmm. right, then, right, right? Then it becomes tenable and the schools will probably never have to go back to Zoom again. But right now, you're right, okay? A lot of people are sick of it. They're taking their kids leaving Hong Kong. But I would like to, you know, plead with them to give Hong Kong one more chance and don't leave yet. We've had a good year or two years to learn lessons from other countries. Look at, you know, what works and what doesn't work somehow. We, it's, it looks like we're right at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, we continue to practice zero, uh, zero COVID. We should have no exemption whatsoever. If we practice the zero COVID, shouldn't we be mandating the, the vaccine then? With the vaccine, uh, it has been proven that it will only protect those that are infected from uh, serious illness. It does not uh, stop you from passing the virus on to others. All right. So because of that, if you want to force somebody to get vaccine, they will say, on what ground would you want me to do that? Right. And if you say it's for your own safety, they would uh, say you're affecting the lives of others. They would say, no, that's not what the experts said. The thing is, though, is if we are to live with this zero COVID, then people not taking the vaccine does affect our life and our quality of life. No. It, it does, because how can we get to if zero believe, COVID when if we have... If you believe the premise that vaccination only protect those that are infected from serious illnesses, all right, they have to answer for themselves. Let's talk about this uh, dynamic zero uh, policy, COVID zero policy. Is this very, how realistic is it that Hong Kong can do this when so many other countries are living with a virus? This is really, really a good question. In a sense, we are caught between a rock and a hard place. All right. Uh, but I would say that uh, in life, you cannot have to kick and eat it too. We, is a, we have an open society connecting to the rest of the world. But then we have to practice zero COVID because we are part of China. 
And connecting with China is equally as important to a lot of people than connecting with the rest of the world. Practicing zero COVID requires two uh, things. First of all, basically the population is docile. They do listen to the government. Whatever you ask them to do, they will do. And secondly, you have a regime that is very efficient and enough manpower uh, on the government side to enforce the zero COVID, such as immediate lockdown, specific districts. We don't have either of these conditions. First of all, our government don't have that kind of manpower to enforce the kind of uh, control that mainland would. And secondly, the mindset of Hong Kong people is different than mindset of mainlanders. Right. right. right? So Just the case of vaccination, yes. even with people dying by the dozen every day, the elderly still, you know, don't feel that right. they should take so the va that's, vaccine. That's, I mean, that's exactly it. How can Hong Kong uh, live with this zero COVID policy and still retain its status as an international business hub? while trying to please China. All the investors and businessmen in the world should realize that Hong Kong is not a place where everything is perfect. In terms of COVID, they would encounter a lot of inconveniences. But on the other hand, in terms of part of the 14th five-year plan, all the policies in the future that China will have benefiting Hong Kong, that mix businesses stationed in Hong Kong much easier to uh, expand and grow in China, that's a trade-off. Right. So people who move it from Hong Kong to Singapore, obviously in the short term, in terms of COVID, lifestyle, everything, Singapore is better than Hong Kong. But in the long term, is it easier for Singapore uh, headquartered uh, 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 business to do business in China without all the policies benefiting a Hong Kong registered company? They have to decide. Right. And so Hong Kong should have some special privileges over any other city. Absolutely. If we, we are going to practice zero COVID, with, together with China until the day China changed their policy. I'm talking about mainland, okay? Until they change. Okay. During that time, all the inconveniences that we suffer that cause foreign investors to have second thought, China will have to somehow compensate with extra policies that would favor us. That's the only way we can survive. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That's our show for this week. Join us again on Pearl Magazine next week. Stay strong, stay safe, Hong Kong. Good night.